Reading this evening comes from the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 2. We're going to be reading verses 14 through 19. I'm reading from the King James Version. So beginning in verse 14 of 2 Timothy, chapter 2, it is written, Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will lead us doth the canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and... Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Good evening. Nice to see you this evening. The problem that existed in the even beginning part of the church when there are men like Hymenius and Philetus, who were mentioned by name in the text that we just had read in our hearing a moment ago, is they did not subscribe to or hold to the same hermeneutic that the Apostle Paul did. Now, I know that the vast majority of you, perhaps not every one of you, but the vast majority of you have heard of that term hermeneutic before. And it just kind of sounds like one of those $50 theological terms, right? I will tell you this. In Scrabble, it'll get you 18 points. If you pluralize it, it will get you 19 points. But hermeneutics is the study of interpretation. There are lots of different kinds of hermeneutics. It is something that does not refer only to biblical studies. But hermeneutics deals with the idea or the study of interpretation, interpreting the interpretation of communication. As far as its etymology, when you look at that word hermeneutics, most scholars and etymological historians believe that it actually comes from the Greek god Hermes. You remember when the apostle Paul and Barnabas on their first evangelistic journey, as we would read about that beginning in Acts 13 and taking us through Acts 14 as well. When they came in that shorter of Paul's three journeys, but of that first journey, they came to the city of Lystra. And when they got to the city of Lystra, they found a particular man who was crippled and he was born crippled. They knew the man, they knew his mother, and the apostle Paul healed them, and of course Paul and Barnabas being together, but by the power of God and through the authority of Jesus Christ, he was healed of his being crippled. The people of Lystra spoke out in the Lyconian language, and there they referred to Barnabas as Zeus, you remember that text, and then they called Paul Hermes, or Mercury, depending upon the translation, or if we're going to use the Greek god, which would be Hermes, and its equal in the Roman mythology would be Mercury. Now, I want you to think about that. Uh, Jupiter was considered a very chief god, but they referred to Paul as Hermes, or Mercury, because it says, as Luke records in the narrative, that he, Paul, was what? The chief speaker. Now, being aware a little bit of about the kind of Greek and Grecian and Roman mythology and their study of what we would refer to even as demions of gods, you probably have seen the various artist renditions of Mercury or Hermes and what was on Mercury or Hermes' feet. Wings, exactly. Because in that mythology, there we see that Hermes would be the one that would take the messenger of either Zeus or Jupiter, again talking Greek or Roman, 
and would take the message to the fortunate or sometimes not so fortunate people. The message of the chief God. And he would became this messenger type of God. And so in this mythology, and these people were very superstitious, were they not? In this Gentile pagan world, and so Paul and Barnabas are preaching to them. A miracle has taken place. They refer to them as gods and refer to Paul then as this messenger god, hence Hermes. And so it is thought that the idea of the field of hermeneutics is when a message is delivered, it requires an understanding or an interpretation. Therefore, we have this term that is known as hermeneutics, the understanding and the interpretation of communication. Hence, whenever we talk about biblical hermeneutics, then it becomes the understanding or the interpretation of the Bible, of Scripture. And so it is a term that we will use from time to time, again, in the study of the field of hermeneutics. And it has a lot of subfields to it as well and topics that are very interesting, and I don't really want to go into that so much. But to understand that the Apostle Paul, being an apostle of Jesus Christ, being an inspired yes, but the Apostle Paul certainly had a way in which he understood Scripture. And I would suggest to you that even Paul, before he was an apostle, when he was known as Saul of Tarsus, was Paul or Saul of Tarsus a man that understood the authority of God's word? Absolutely. That as a Jew and as a Pharisee, and a Pharisee of Pharisees, whose father was a Pharisee, who saw himself as a young man, studied at the feet of Gamaliel, a very respected Pharisee, on the Sanhedrin Council. I find it very interesting that Saul or Paul had tremendous respect for the law of God. And so he always had a very interesting view, and what we might even say is a very sound or conservative view regarding God's word and how it is to be understood. Now, he becomes a Christian. And he realizes that we are no longer, especially the Jews of that day, we're no longer under the law of Moses. And that the law of Moses and the Jewish economy was abrogated. It had come to an end. And it was all fulfilled by Jesus Christ. And so the old covenant, which is past, now being ushered into a new covenant through Jesus Christ and through the sacrificial blood sacrifice of Jesus, and the blood of Jesus is what ratified the new covenant. And when the Apostle Paul became aware of the gospel of Jesus Christ and of the covenant of Jesus Christ that we have in this new covenant, this new law, if you will, Paul still does not move away from his understanding of the authority of Scripture. In fact, how many times would Paul say himself that as he would write his letter that we had to abide according to the Scripture? Now, the reading that we had just a moment ago that Brother Dennis did for us is 2 Timothy chapter 2. But we know that in the next chapter, chapter 3 and verse 16, it is Paul who says that all Scripture is given by what? The inspiration of God. It's God-breathed. We're going to deal with that in just a couple of moments. But he understood that Scripture is inspired. It's from God. And when Paul says that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God, think about when he said it, where he said it, that home time setting. And what scripture would he have been specifically referring to when he spoke of scripture's validity and inspired nature? The Old Testament. In the hermeneutic of Paul, that is his, his understanding and his interpretation of scripture, even aside from the fact that he is inspired, as an apostle, is he being guided by the Holy Spirit in writing the letters that he wrote? We know that to be the case. And yet at the same time, with that, he has this very sound, solid view of Scripture, of the authority of God's Word, and it's important for Paul to make sure that not only that he is going to teach it accurately, but he is going to live it. Now here's the point that I want to make that sometimes we don't always make when we're talking about hermeneutics. And we could go into another area of this, but we're not going to, that when we start talking about making sure that we're abiding by the, the commandments or the statements, those express statements, 
and that apostolic precedent or example and even necessary inference and conclusion and I don't want to go into that. What I want us to understand is that first and foremost, we, we appreciate and we accept the full validity of Scripture that is inspired, that it is the Word of God, and it is our only source of authority. Now, we get that. But here's the part we don't always reinforce it. In the hermeneutic, we are not just to academically accept that, which we must do. I'm going to tell you right now, friends, we've got to live it. Do you see what I'm saying? That it needs to be alive in our lives. That it needs to be real in our lives. There are far too many people that accept the Bible and will say, yes, it's inspired and that it's the Word of God. But then not practice it. And the difference between Paul and so many of his contemporaries and peers, especially in Judaism, was they did not have the heart that he had. Remember what he had said to the Corinthians. We know what he had said that to the Corinthians that they are to be imitators of him even as he was of Christ. When he became a Christian, what became first and foremost of Paul? To follow the steps of Jesus Christ. But he had also noted, as we could read in the book of Acts, that even as he reflected on his old life when he was persecuting the church of God, did he feel, when he was persecuting Christians, the church of God, did he feel very sincerely with all of his heart that he was doing the right thing. In fact, he said he did it with what kind of a conscience? A good conscience. He says, I did this. He says, all that I did, I did with a good conscience before God and men to this day. You know why? Because that was the hermeneutic that was built into his character. Now, I don't know if it's because he was taught that by his father, who evidently was a Pharisee, if that was something emphasized to him because of Gamaliel. And we do have somewhat of a positive treatment of Gamaliel in Acts chapter 5, when the other of the Sanhedrin council were ready to kill the apostles, did not Gamaliel step forward and prevent them from doing that, and even said, if this thing is of men, it will come to nothing. Let there be the test of time. But if it is of God, Gamaliel even recognized that if it's of God, we cannot fight against it. Something became such a great influence in the life of Paul that this hermeneutic is what guided him throughout his entire life. When he came to the truth of Jesus Christ, then he had no problem abandoning the old system of faith that he now understands is fulfilled and no longer in existence in reality. But his hermeneutic and his view towards scripture, I want to suggest to you, never changed. D does that make sense? It never changed. He was a man that believed in the authority of God's word and a man that was trying to practice it to the best of his ability. Now, here's the question. Is that where we are? One, do we accept God's word as the final authority? And two, are we willing to live it in our lives in a very personal way? Now, having said that, we go to this text that's very, very well known. It was our memory verse back when we were in 2 Timothy chapter 2 some time ago. Not all that long ago, really. And depending on the translation, and I have more of a New King James translation that we have here, Dennis read for us from the King James Version. But he says, be diligent, as opposed to study. But be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I've preached plenty of those sermons that just took apart this verse for these three major points that the reason why we need to be diligent in our study of God's word is, one, that we might have God's approval. Two, that we will not be ashamed, principally, primarily of ignorance. And three, that we might handle God's word with precision or accuracy. Now, while I wish to still certainly emphasize those points, I want us to look at this yet even a little deeper in a little different way. Because I believe there are a few other obvious applications to this as well. And so, while there may be controversy in the minds of a lot of folks about the best way 
to interpret or the best methodology for the interpretation of the Bible, again, the field of hermeneutics. I like Paul's hermeneutic as he instructs Timothy to do this. And if this inspired apostle has instructed Timothy to do this, and if that is a valid, valid approach, which I submit to you that it certainly is, of 1900 years ago, it's a valid approach today. But you know what? Think about it. Why is it that so many people do not want to use that valid approach? Because people want to believe that things have changed, time has changed, culture has changed, society has changed, and therefore the Word of God, the Bible has changed, and people don't want to apply it the same way. When you do that, then what happens? Moral standards are changed. Doctrinal standards when it comes to the church of what it is, how we worship, what our work is to be, how we're organized. Very important theological, biblical subjects. Subjects that deal with eschatology, end times. What's going to happen when Jesus returns? Is there going to be a judgment? The doctrine of eternity of heaven and hell. You name it, from morality to doctrine to end times. That when we change the hermeneutic in our view and understanding of scripture. And if we think for a moment that because society has changed. And somehow that we become so enlightened and so different than what those poor, ignorant people were 2,000 years ago. And I'm saying it that way because I believe with all of my heart that the arrogance of some people today is, well, you know what, back then, those people that were in ignorance, they don't have the knowledge, they don't have the enlightenment, they don't have the things that we have today. They needed that, but we don't need that today. And look what happens to the hermeneutic. D does that make sense? I believe that's exactly what's going on. Now, when I talk about Paul's hermeneutic then, the very first thing, and I just have three, we're almost done with this sermon, by the way. We really are. I told Vicki as I was getting ready to leave, I said, how about a short sermon tonight? And she said, yeah. <laughs> when we look at Paul's hermeneutic, Bible study is to be personal. Would you agree with that? That's wonderful that we can get together and have sermons like we're having or have Bible class on Sunday morning, a Bible class on, on Wednesday evenings. To have collective Bible studies. You know, you can go over to, to Stuart's house and tomorrow night there'll be a collective Bible study. You can go to Barker's home on Tuesday night, there's going to be a collective Bible study. You can come here on Wednesday night, there's going to be a collective Bible study. You can go to Cambria in the Owens house on Saturday mornings at 10.30, there's going to be a collective Bible study. And those are all great, great things to do, and we can share, and we can look at God's Word, and we can do that. But, but what we have to understand, and the Apostle Paul appreciated this, that first and foremost, that Bible study needs to be very personal. Because this is God's Word Talking to, we can say, yes, us, collectively. But you know the way we really need to take it? It's God's word talking to me. As God's word is talking to each and every one of us, every one of you, including me. That's why he says, in the word, the Greek word spadatso that is used here. You've heard me say that word many, many times before. Some of you probably have written it a little in your, in, in, in your Bible, spude, and then it developed to spadatso. And it means make every effort, do your best, be diligent. The, 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 the translation study, the fact of the matter is, is a little weak. It involves study, but it's much greater than that because it's talking about a diligence of dealing with something it, to the very best of your ability. Spadazzo in this form, Paul uses it a lot in his life. The only time that it's ever translated as study in the King James Version is right in this text. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but what I'm telling you is that when you look at this word spadazzo that's found a good handful of times in, all, in Paul's letters, you're going to see that it's the idea of be diligent. Make every effort do your best. Does that make sense? This is why he used it. It is a very intensified word. And notice how personal it is. Be diligent, he says to Timothy, to present yourself. Approved to God. Now normally I, I, I highlight the approval part here. I've done that in many sermons. You've heard those sermons. And you might have thought, oh no, he's doing it again. 
But no, my highlighting here is not so much the approval, it's there. But what I really want to highlight here is that make it personal. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. It is absolutely true that as Christians, we must stand ready to give a defense. To give that answer. Remember 1 Peter 3.15? But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to do what? To provide or give an answer, a defense. Remember the Greek word apologia, an apologetic? It's an explanation. I shared this with several of you not long ago that we were in a restaurant the other day and an old fella comes up to us at the table and he introduces himself and, and he, says, he says, I know your profession. I said, okay. He said, I have a question for you. He says, doesn't it say somewhere in the Bible that as Christians that we are to be ready to give an answer or a defense if somebody asks us a question about the Bible? And I said, yes, that's 1 Peter 3.15. He said, I've been trying to think where that is. And so we chatted about that. And so after dinner was over, I went over, I went over to his table and, and talked to he and his wife and so forth. And he told me about how about several years ago in Oklahoma City. And that he said that he had gone to like the, the 10th Street Church of Christ in Oklahoma City and was baptized. I said, well, where have you been? He's very old. He's like 92 years old. So I see him now occasionally, but now we've made this connection. I'm going to keep asking, where are you? But here's the point. You see, he had been in a discussion with somebody. And he was trying to tell them that Christians have responsibility to provide an answer because the discussion evidently, was, it was telling me about the situation, is that these people that were talking about religion, it was almost like this thing, well, you know what? People just have their opinions in religion, and you just shouldn't really get too involved or too deep into it and don't worry about it. He says, but I just knew there was something saying, no, that we are supposed to be prepared to give an answer. Is he right? That's what it says. Because in the hermeneutic, that's making Bible study, uh, 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 a Bible study very personal to each and every one of us. And not only that we are to give an answer, as 1 Peter 3.15 says, but even as the Apostle Paul would say in 2 Timothy 2.25 and 26, that the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle uh, to all, able to teach patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps, perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. So not only do we need to take it personal that we're going to be able to pro provide an answer, but do we need to be ready to correct that which is wrong biblically? We live in a society today that can say, you know what, we don't really think that you should be doing that. Because after all, does anybody here have friends or family members that hold that view? That's your opinion. You know, that's fine. That's good for you. But in my heart, it's this. And people don't want to take a biblical stand. What I'm saying, brethren, is that we've got to take it personal. And here's the other point, though. That when we take it personal, not only that we can provide the answer, make that defense, that apologia, and that we can also correct those that are saying something that's not biblically correct, but then we've got to take it personal from the standpoint that we are living it, so that we can take Matthew 7, 1 and put it in its right context. The question that came up yesterday at the Cambria Bible class. Because for a few weeks we're going to be playing this thing where you, you know, you've heard this before, the old stump the chump, where they're, they're going to be asking questions and I've got to field these questions. Justin yesterday Owens asked a great question. He says, what do you do when people bring up Matthew 7, 1? Judge not, lest you be judged, because you're talking to people. You know, they, oh, you know what this says? Judge not. Jesus said, judge not, lest you be not judged. But as we discuss that, the very first thing that Justin's going to take him to, he's going to say, have you read the next four verses? That's always helpful, isn't it? And what Jesus is saying, that for whatever judgment you use, the same is going to be measured against you, Right? That in other words, you better practice what you preach. It better be personal in your own life. And before you decide to take the speck out of your brother's eye, you better make sure that you've removed what? The log out of your own. But here's the question I ask. Do we have a responsibility to help remove specks from people's eyes? Yes. But 
If we're trying to remove specks and we're ignoring the log or the beam that is in our own eye, that's not taking the hermeneutic personally. And it becomes, hence, hypocritical. Does that make sense? I want everything to make sense tonight. You know, normally I, I always try to want it to make sense. Bible study is to be personal. And if it's not personal, we will be seen as hypocrites. Make Bible study personal in your life. Now, I'll say this before we move on. That means you have to pick it up and you've got to read it. Personally read it. And read it. And think about it. And as we talked about in this morning's lesson, pray about it. Meditate. Make it personal. Paul's hermeneutic, though, continues. Then when we look at the verse, not only did he say to be diligent, present yourself, prove to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed. And I think that we're going to highlight, and again, I usually highlight the idea, we don't want to be ashamed of ignorance. But here is the very pragmatic part of it, that diligence in Bible study and dealing with the Word of God that we are to be viewed as a worker, as a worker who does not need to be ashamed. But this worker, that is Bible study, is to be practical. I think the scripture is very practical, very pragmatic. That the scripture hits us where we live. That's God's word. It's because it's inspired. Because it's truth. And because God knows us better than we know ourselves. And therefore, in his word, he's showing how this is to be very practical. A worker who does not need to be ashamed. Now, I had to admit, I absolutely admit, the word hermeneutic is not in the Bible. Oh, well, Hermes is there in that different little application. Hermeneutic's not in there. I'll tell you what else isn't in there. The word intellectualism is not in there. The word, the word academic is not in there. Even the word scholarship is not in there. Now, we live in a society where many people are very much impressed and moved by academia, scholarship, and intellectualism. But those are words that are not in there. Now, you may read about some people who obviously had some academia and who had some scholarship, even Paul himself. Evidently, does Paul have some deep, good education? He did. But you'll notice with Paul that while he may have referred to that a couple of times, that's not what he highlights and that's not where the emphasis is. And again, I want to say to you that while those words like intellectualism and academia and scholarship are not found in the Bible, take a look at the words that are found in the Bible. Do, doer, work, and obey. <laughs> and you know what? We have people today say, oh, no, 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 that's not what I'm looking for in the Bible. We want somebody that has a great education, and somebody certainly from the pulpit, it would be nice if they have a Ph.D., and they've been to some theological seminary, and if they're going to be able to have their Ph.D. in philosophy or in some other field and so forth, and they have all of this rich, deep academia... I'm going to tell you that in the training program that we do here, there is a degree of academia involved, and there's a degree of real study that has to be done. In fact, I'll tell you what, in some respects, it's grueling. It really is. I've often said, I feel sorry for these guys. You know, they really, but you know, David, I guess David and Bailey are not here. David said to me the other day, okay, is this being recorded, Stuart? You may have listened to it, but anyway. <laughs> Unless he listens to it, then he can deal with it. Don't you tell him. He says to me the other day, and I was in the copy room making some copies and finishing something. I was walking out, and he's sitting at the desk, and he's pouring over his studies and really, really looking at his lessons that he's going to be preaching. That he's preaching today up in, he's up in the, the Bay Area in Fairfield. And he says, you know, Brent, he says, I, I, I kind of got a feeling that some people think that I'm just breezing through this program, that this is easy for me. Have any of you thought that? How many of those thought that? Okay, I, I got my hand up too. And he says, he says, that is just so far from the truth. 
And then he began to explain, because, and then I knew, because I knew this too, because he spends an incredible amount of hours here. But I also know the amount of hours that he spends in his little apartment. Uh, you know, his last, last week, last Thursday, he, yeah, there's the academic part. He had a major Hebrew vocabulary test of about 150 words from 14 sections, and he missed one. He misspelled a few, but we don't really count too much for that. But he missed one. He has an inordinate amount of memory work to do. He has term papers that are due about every two weeks. He has to produce new, two new sermon outlines every week. He has to write a bulletin article. He has to read. He's doing two different ways in which he's doing complete Bible reading. So he'll have read through the entire Bible at least two times, perhaps three times this year. Plus, he's doing right now major reports on all the prophets of the Old Testament, and he's giving those to me at the pace of one or two a week. And he's, he'll finish. Do you, you think you would like to go through this program, Bryce? Now, what I'm telling you is that there is a degree of academia to it. It really is. But aside from all of that, let me tell you where our best discussions come in. Our best discussions come in when he asks the questions or when we talk about, Brent, in doing this and dealing with people or dealing with the congregation and preaching the gospel or teaching classes and dealing with people, what is the best way to handle the... And all these questions deal with what? Practicality, practical things, and making the gospel practical. Now, you kind of have to do your homework if you're going to do this well. I believe that with all my heart. And I believe that we need to be diligent even in academic studies of the Bible. I believe that with all my heart. And I think too many congregations have become satisfied with a heartbeat in the pulpit, and that's sad. We need people that are prepared and that take this serious. But I want to tell you right now, the thing that impresses me so much about the Apostle Paul is that how practical it was in his life. Because study is to be more than than, than just vocational. Study is to be more than just intellectual. Study is to be more than academic. Study diligent in God's word is to be practical. What does this mean to me personally? And what does this mean to the congregation? Because, ladies and gentlemen, being a Christian, a child of God, this is our vocation. Not that we have some kind of degree in Bible. But our vocation, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with you, which you are called. He's not writing to preachers here. He's writing to Christians. Verse 2, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit of the bond of peace. This is personal and it's practical. And this is to be our vocation. Christianity is not our avocation. It is our vocation we got to understand that it's practical. Bible study. Make Bible study practical in your everyday life. And then I close with this. As he says, yes, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. A worker does not need to be ashamed. As he writes to Timothy, and don't forget, Timothy is a preacher, and he's got a great responsibility in Ephesus there, doesn't he? But he says, rightly dividing the word of truth. How many times have you heard me Define and illustrate the Greek word orthotomeo. Orthotomeo. You, you all ought to know it. Uh, most of you. Ortho, common Greek prefix, that means what? Straight, very good. Like an orthodontist. So you can have straight teeth. Tomeo, temne, the verb to cut. To cut straight. Originally, a nautical term used by captains of boats and ships because as they wanted to pilot their boat and get from A to B, they would like to ortho to mayo because geometrically, the shortest distance between two points is what? A straight line. And if they could cut a straight path, ortho to mayo, to cut it straight, then they would get there in a very efficient period of time. And so when the winds were good and the, and, the, and, and the currents were fine, and they could do that. Because if the winds and the currents were not agreeable, then they would have to do something what sailors call tacking. Tacking. But that's not quite orthotomeo. 
It would come on to take later on even a medical surgical idea too to cut straight because it implies accuracy or precision. To do what? Rightly divide the word of truth. In other words, the word of truth, God's word, the Bible, right? That we are to rightly divide the word of truth. We need to take God's word and it is imperative that we handle this word with accuracy, with precision, that we ortho to male, cut it straight, precisely, taking context into consideration, history into consideration, grammar into consideration, lexical analysis into consideration. All of those fields are wonderful, but we have to look at this. This is something that we need to become proficient in when we handle God's word. Okay? Now... The requirement, I'll just, I've just bulleted these points in those that are following on the outline on the back of the bullet. We've already dealt with this. Do we need to recognize the inspiration of Scripture? I'm not doing the apologetic tonight of, saying, of trying to prove why it's inspired. I think most of us believe that, but that's an important field too. But all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The very first thing that when we are involved in this proficient dealing with God's word, there has to be the recognition of inspiration. Number two, do we need to know the difference in the delineation between Old Testament and New Testament? Do you know how many people don't do that? They call themselves Christians? And they find themselves all over the Bible taking passages and commandments out of the Old Testament, want to bring them over to the New Testament because maybe they can't prove what they want to prove here. So I'll run back over here in the Old Testament and I'll grab that, and I'll bring it on over to here. And they would not dare do that consistently with everything. Can you imagine if they did? What Christianity would look like? And it's not saying that the Old Testament is not valuable. Romans 15, 4, whatever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Is it important to study the book of Judges sometimes on Wednesday nights? And are there valuable lessons and principles that we can learn? Yes. But are we under that specific law that they were under at that time? The law of Moses, the old covenant? Are we going to take the priesthood? Are we going to take the forms of worship? Are we going to go ahead and take the psalms and whatnot and bring them over and then try to mechanically use it in those ways? No, we're not going to do that. But how many people do? And that's not proficient. And then it brings us to the contextual consideration as well. Number three. You know Peter's warning that you have there in 2 Peter 3 and verse 14. He says, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found in him peace without spot and blameless, and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, this is what Peter says, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, also in all of his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which some things hard, are hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do the rest of the scriptures. One, did he acknowledge that Paul's epistles and writings were scripture? He did. But did he also warn that people can take scripture and twist it to their own destruction? That's the warning. And the way how people do that is they don't take context into consideration. I know some of you are thinking, that's Brent, you talk about context all the time. Context, context, context. Because it's important. And then how valuable is number four, do not add to nor subtract from it. And what we have in Revelation, which deals with the book of Revelation, but recognize that was something that was articulated even long ago as early in two different places in the book of Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy 4 and Deuteronomy 12. But remember what the writer says in Revelation 22, 18, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. You don't want that. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life. You don't want that happening either. Don't add to, do not take away. Bible study is to be proficient. Let us become more proficient in our study of the Bible. Make Bible study very personal in your life. Make Bible study very practical in your life. And become more proficient in reading, studying, and understanding the Bible. And so I say to you, the valid hermeneutic 
the valid hermeneutic, will look into, learn from, and live by with the Word of God. And that's another sermon with three points right there. And I like the alliteration to boot. But I want to say it again, that a valid hermeneutic will look into, learn from, and live by the Word of God. And any other approach, any other approach may make you a master in trivial pursuit of the Bible. But it won't do much for preparing you for eternity. This isn't about just learning all the facts we can about the Bible. This is about making it real in our lives. And that's the hermeneutical that we need, that we may live by all three of those points. And the lesson, hopefully, is all of ours. And I thank you for your patience. Is it real in your life? I know I'm talking primarily, just about exclusively, to Christians tonight, with the exception of some of our very young ones. But we have a couple of others that need to be thinking about this. And if you're ready to obey the gospel, we want to help you. We want to sit down with you. Let's talk. Let's look at the Bible. Let's see what God says. But if we can assist you in any spiritual need, whatever that may be, let it be known at this time. So we're going to sing the song of invitation. Please be standing. <laughs>